So let's move on now and um, look at everything to do with Hyperdraw. Okay, this is a major part of this chapter, all right? There's a lot to learn for Hyperdraw. Now, I've referred to Hyperdraw several times throughout this chapter, and when I have, I've tended to say uh, Hyperdraw is uh, kind of left over from the days of hardware synths, and to some extent that's true, uh, because Hyperdraw was originally developed for uh, doing all your controller stuff for hardware synths. And, of course, it still is used today for hardware synths, okay? But, you know, there are several reasons for learning Hyperdraw. Um, one, for example, is that you might use hardware or want to use hardware, uh, so it's good to learn it for that. Uh, you, you might be thinking of going on to a college course or something soon, in which case, isn't it good to learn as much as possible about logic? Yeah, of course it is. Get yourself a head start, you know. Um, the other thing is, uh, hardware is very, very cheap now, right? Um, I'm not talking about like classic since costing thousands of pounds, but good hardware synths are now cheaper than plugins. It's a buyer's market, and nobody wants to know hardware synths. Yeah, so you can pick up some incredible bargains. Uh, so you might be thinking of integrating hardware into your setup, and um, again, you'll need to learn Hyperdraw for controlling those synths. Well, what about, you know, in the future, if somebody brings a hardware synth around and says that oh, we want to use this in the session and uh, you've got to do some cr controls for it, again, you, uh, are you going to not know what to do and sit there going, oh, I don't know what to do? Oh, of course not. You know, So we need to learn it for all those reasons. But even if we're never going to use hardware, we still need to learn Hyperdraw because of all the fantastic techniques and tricks you can do with Hyperdraw, right? There's a lot more to Hyperdraw than just controlling hardware synth controllers, yeah? There's some great stuff we can do with it, great creative techniques and stuff, yeah? So let's now look at the whole thing to do with Hyperdraw, all right? Okay, so Hyperdraw is this controller lane, is this, this display area that you open in Piano Edit using this swimming tadpole icon, right? And Hyperdraw is this display area where you view, input, and edit all MIDI controller data that lives in the region, okay, that you're editing. Now, if there are no MIDI controllers at all living in the region, then when you open Hyperdraw, by default, it displays note velocity for the notes in the pattern. Note velocity is a form of MIDI controller. And if I use the, um, the velocity tool and drag up and down on a note to change its velocity, you see that node for that note, that velocity node, moving up and down in the hyperdraw area. And likewise, you can also use the pointer tool and grab on the node and drag it up and down. Okay? Or a group of nodes. Remember, this is controller information node velocity, so I choose the automation select tool. I can grab a bunch of nodes and move them up and down, adjusting the velocity of all those nodes, keeping their relative levels just as if I used the velocity tool outside here and grabbed a group of notes and adjusted their velocity up and down. Okay, so that's Hyperdraw. It's the display area for controller information in the region you're editing, which by default shows note velocity, the most basic form of MIDI controller, when opened if no other controllers live in that region. Hyperdraw in, in the old days was where you would do all the controller stuff for your hardware synths. And it's the same today if you use hardware. Okay, so let's look at that first. Let's look at how one would control hardware synths with Hyperdraw. Now, there are two ways of having control data put into your Hyperdraw, into your region, to control a hardware synth. The first way is you input that controller movement manually by drawing it in using the various tools. Now to do that you need to look up the controller numbers for the parameters of your synth. So you get the manual or you look on the internet and you find out that your hardware synth responds to MIDI controller number 74 for the filter cutoff. So therefore we need to choose MIDI controller 74. So we go to our list on the left here. Now let's just look at this list a second. When we drop this list down, there are these main menu items here, right? Pitch bend, volume, modulation, sustain pedal, etc. These are all common parameters that every single synth responds to that on the same controller number. So they're listed as primary controllers 
without a number in this main menu. So you can quickly choose pitch bend and put in some pitch bend, etc. But beyond the basics that all synths respond to on the same controller numbers, these basics like you know modulation and pitch bend, etc. After that, most synths have the parameters of the synth controlled by different controller numbers. So we want to set up controller number 74 to control the cutoff of our synth because we've looked in its manual and we found out that controller number 74 controls the cutoff for our hardware synth. So we go down the list and we choose other. And then we are presented with this list. Now this is a list of basic MIDI continuous controllers okay that's MIDI CC controllers CC means continuous controller and by default MIDI gives you 128 possible CC controllers from 0 to 127 they're all listed by number some of them have a name next to the number okay uh, in the case of modulation for example that's just you know the name of MIDI controller number one is modulation and all since respond to MIDI controller one for, for modulation but other parameters that are listed by name as well such as this number 74 brightness these are general MIDI names okay now without going into too much depth general MIDI is a standard for synthesizers and if you want your synthesizer to conform to general MIDI standards and to to receive an official general MIDI stamp of a you know like a, a logo showing the public this is a general MIDI synth and it's certified as a general MIDI synth then your synth must respond on MIDI controller 74 for the filter cutoff which gen general MIDI calls brightness likewise it must respond on MIDI controller number 71 for the filter resonance etc okay so that's general MIDI names okay so anyway we've looked up in our synth manual and we've discovered that by coincidence our synth, even if it's not a GM synth, responds to the filter control for the cutoff on MIDI controller 74. So we choose 74 and then we simply get the pointer tool and click anywhere in this area and we input a node and this green line appears. It, it may be a different colour depending on the controller you've chosen but there it is. Now as soon as you put in one node, a node always appears at the beginning of the region, bear that in mind. And then once we've got that node in with the pointer tool, we can drag on it to move it around in time and, and amount. And then click on the line to input further nodes, all with the pointer tool, and we draw in a basic movement like that. And now we've drawn in a, a movement that will control and sweep our cutoff on our hardware synth. That's now living in the region with the notes, and if you look at the region display here, you see that now there is not only the little note dots in that uh, region display but now there are these little vertical ladders showing there is a controller move in there as well okay so we've now put a filter sweep into our pattern manually on MIDI controller number 74 which we looked up in our manual for our synth and we found out that was the controller number that controlled the synth's cutoff so when I hit the play if this pattern this track was triggering an external hardware synth um, and it's and its filter cutoff did respond to MIDI controller 74 you'd hear the synth play and this would sweep its cutoff but I'm actually programming uh, doing all this using an ESM synth on an audio instrument track and this does not respond to uh, MIDI CC 74 for the cutoff but you know you'd hit play and the notes would play and this would sweep the filter okay so then you think okay now I want to put in a resonance sweep so same procedure, you look up in your manual and you find out that the resonance on your synth responds to MIDI controller number 90, let's say. So we drop down the list, we choose other, we go down the list, we choose MIDI controller number 90, like that. And the same thing, we click with the pointer tool, input our first node, a node always appears at the beginning of the region. And then we can drag the node around and input further nodes and we have now put in some movement for adjusting and controlling our resonance control of our synth across that region. Okay, so now we've got two layers of MIDI control in there and we put them in manually. That's the first way of putting MIDI controller data into Hyperdraw. You look up the numbers and you draw them in manually. Now don't worry, I'll, I'll, we'll do the tools next showing all the way that you can manipulate and do things here, right? Okay, now I can show you something else. We have got two controllers living in here now, MIDI controller 74 and MIDI controller 90, as well as the note velocities. And here's a technique. 
even if hyperdraw is closed right you hold down command and repeatedly press the y key so command y command y command y command y command y and it cycles around hyperdraw showing every MIDI controller that lives in there one after the other finally it shows the note velocities and then closes commands and Y for Yankee command Y command Y command Y command Y command Y okay so that's how you cycle around showing all controllers living in a region and believe it or not that same cycling around actually works in the arrange area you can access hyperdraw in place on regions in the arrange area as long as that's your active edit window you just highlight the region and command Y, command Y, command Y. You cycle around the controllers exactly the same until it cycles around to the off state like that, that where the region displays its color. Command Y, command Y, command Y, command Y. And believe it or not, you can actually edit these in place. Look, you can actually edit command Y. Your hyperdraw in the regions in place in the arrange area if you want to, even adjusting the velocity nodes. I don't recommend you do that, but bear in mind you can do that. Command Y, Command Y, Command Y, Command Y, etc. Okay, sure, that's one way of putting controller information in the old days or now if you're using hardware since into your patterns. You look up the numbers and draw them in manually. Okay, now let's look at inputting controllers for hardware into Hyperdraw um, using actual hardware controllers, you know, like moving pots and sliders and stuff like that. Let's just uh, reduce this zoom. Let's look at that next. Okay, so recording control information in manually using hardware controllers rather than drawing it in. Okay, that's the other way you can get control information into regions uh, to, to control your external hardware. Now there are two possible scenarios for this. Okay, The first scenario is where you have the type of synth that has dedicated controllers on the front which you can adjust, whether they're pots or sliders, you know, something like a Novation Base Station uh, or a Supernova or an Access Virus or, or a JD-900 uh, or a JP-8000, any of those synths that have got dedicated pots on the front. It's very simple. You want to adjust the and record in some filter cutoff moves. So you go to the slider or pot which is labelled filter cutoff, you just twiddle it, and that pot will send out the correct controller number into logic, which can then be recorded. But you might have the type of synth, maybe it's a rack synth, maybe it's an older synth that doesn't have dedicated controller pots that send out MIDI uh, controllers, in which case you need to use a third party controller. But whichever way you do it, it's the same. You just simply are using a hardware controller, whether it's a slider, a wheel, or a pot, that's sending out the correct MIDI controller number to control that parameter of the synth, and then you simply record it, just like recording notes. So let's do that now. Now, I don't have a synth attached to this, but I will show you it in the, from the point of view of using a third-party controller. Let me just cycle around, command Y, command Y. There is no other controller information living in that region. I can tell by just doing command Y and it opens, shows the note velocity and then closes. Right, so that's that. Okay, so now we know that the MIDI controller for our fictitious hardware synth, uh, the cutoff is on MIDI controller number 74, right? So in the case of where you're using a third party hardware controller, um, that would be something like a Behringer BCR rotary controller or a Korg Nano controller. You need to set up that, that one of the pots to send out MIDI controller number 74 because we know that's the controller number that controls the cutoff of our synth. Okay, so we need to set our hardware controller up to send out MIDI controller 74. Now I've done that with this hardware controller I'm using. Now this is an Apogee Duet and it has a function where you can turn the rotary controller on the front into a MIDI controller that sends out MIDI control numbers. And when I rotate the dial you see this GUI from the Duet appear. But if you look down on the transport bar here on the MIDI input monitor of Logic, remember we last looked at that when we were doing the step input programming, yeah? This little MIDI input monitor, when I rotate the Duet, it's now functioning as a third party hardware controller and sure enough if you look at the numbers, it says number one 
on the left right that's the MIDI channel then it says 74 so I'm sending in MIDI controller number 74 and the amount that's changing is the amount of controller number 74 going up and down as I rotate the dial now this is real MIDI information coming into Logic's MIDI input so to record it we need to actually put our track into record and actually record it because we're recording real MIDI data just like notes so select the track hit record and I'll do I'll record and move in there and I'll actually just zoom in slightly first okay here we go record okay now if my synth did respond to MIDI controller 74 that would sweep the filter etc right? but as I say I'm using this software synth ESM okay so let's look what's happened here we have what's happened is we've recorded another region another pattern over the top of the pattern with the notes in okay just put this into beat and I want to snap that to absolute value like that there we go okay so what's happened is I've recorded this layer over the top and this layer only controls that MIDI, MIDI controller number 74 sweep that I recorded in from my hardware controller now in the case of hardware if you put this track here on the same MIDI channel as the one with the notes and you put the controller information on this track and the notes on this track then these would play back and they both you know this track would trigger the synth with the pattern and this track would send that controller data to the synth on the same MIDI channel and both together would control the synth one playing the notes one sweeping the filter the other thing you can do is use the glue tool like that and glue them together merging that control information that you just recorded in to the pattern with the notes and now if we double click piano edit is our active uh, edit window command Y cycle around and there is the MIDI controller number 74 that was recorded in and now I can tidy it up Okay, inevitably when you record in from hardware controllers some tidying up needs to be done because you do get the odd bum node so we just you can do all that so there you go you know you you, you edit what you, what's there and that's that that's now we've got uh, MIDI controller 74 recorded in with our notes and if this was controlling a hardware synth that did respond to MIDI controller 74 for the filter then when we hit play this pattern would trigger that synth and this would sweep the filter Okay, so you think, right, let's put in the second layer now uh, by the same technique. We've looked up in our book. We know that our synth responds to MIDI controller number 90 for the resonance. So, same thing. I need to change my third-party hardware controller to send out MIDI controller number 90. Or, if you were using a hardware synth with dedicated controls on the front that sent out the correct MIDI numbers, you would simply go to the slider or the pot on your synth that is labelled as resonance and you'd simply twiddle it and it would send the correct MIDI controller into Logic to be recorded but we're using this third party hardware controller I've now changed it, it's now sending in MIDI controller number 90 you can see there on the MIDI input monitor of Logic same procedure, hit record, here we go and I'll record in another sweep of MIDI controller number 90 Like that there we go and I've recorded in another layer of control and if we drag this region down again it's done the same thing it's laid the region over the top and it's the same procedure we can merge it in with the original region like that and now we've got two controllers living in this region along with the notes okay and again in piano roll we can cycle around with command Y command Y command Y command Y so there's controller number 74 I can just tweak that or whatever I like command Y there's controller number 90 that we just recorded in I can now tweak it adjust it clear out any bum nodes etc blah 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 this is you know this this is controlling our theoretical hardware synth resonance etc and that's how you do it using external hardware controllers either on the synth itself sending out the correct numbers or you use a third-party controller and set it up to send out the correct number to control your synth Okay, and that's it. And now we've got two layers of MIDI controller information, MIDI CC controller information living in our region along with our notes. And we can cycle around Command Y, 
command Y, command Y, and display those and edit them. Okay, so that's how it worked in the old days with hardware. Okay. Alrighty, um, but you know, a lot of us aren't working with hardware, but as I say, don't worry, because we do need to learn this because of all the tricks we can do. Now, let's move on. And now um, the next thing we should look at is using the tools, how to actually manipulate these nodes and everything like that. OK, so let's look at that next. OK, so let's look at the whole tools thing. Um, now, I'm going to show you a technique now to get rid of these nodes, because I want to thin this out to show you some techniques with the tools and stuff. Um, this is a four bar pattern. OK, now, if I grab on a node at this end, always using the pointer tool, the pointer tool is our default tool, I grab on the end node, and holding down with the mouse, I drag to the left. And what it does is it hoovers up all the other nodes. OK, but if I don't let go and then drag back the other way, all those nodes are resurrected in their exact position, but only the node I've grabbed on is being adjusted. And that works from the other end the same way. Grab the node, drag, it hoovers up all the nodes, but as long as you don't let go and drag back, they're all resurrected again, and only the node I've got hold of is being adjusted. And you can do it from the middle in either direction as well. Okay. But you can use this technique to remove nodes, because if you let go of the node once you've dragged it, then, it, then all those nodes that were hoovered up, so to speak, are gone for good. So I can grab, for example, um, this node and drag it across like that, let go, and now when I drag it back, look, all those other nodes have gone. So I'll use that technique just to tidy this up. I want it to be thinner to show you the tools and what have you, right? Okay, so there you go. Okay, so let's now look at actually manipulating the data. Now, as I said, you use the pointer tool for everything. That's your primary tool. Pointer tool to click on the lines to input nodes, move them around in time or in amount. Okay. You can use the pencil tool to input nodes, but the problem with that is that once you've used the pencil tool to do that, you can't grab nodes with it and move them. You can't delete nodes by clicking on with it. So it's best to use pointer tool, because that allows us to do three things with one tool. Click on nodes to delete them, click on the line to input nodes, and move nodes around. OK, now, and then we have, uh, let's put in a few extra nodes for this, actually. Then we have the oops, the automation select tool. Now that allows us to select everything like that, and then we can, with the same tool, grab on any of the lines in that highlighted selection and drag the whole lot up and down or around in time whilst keeping the relative levels, OK, and click on the background to deselect. Or we can grab a cluster of nodes anywhere amongst our nodes and move those up and down or around in time. Um, you know, whilst keeping everything else still. And the stuff that we're moving retains its relative levels and what have you. Uh, the minimum amount of nodes you can grab is two. You can't grab a single node. Look, if I try and grab that one node, it just doesn't work. Okay, um, you have to grab two nodes. Okay, and what happens is you grab the two nodes as minimum amount you can grab, and then it grabs the two nodes and the line in between them, and the two lines coming off either side until they meet the next node. You've now grabbed that whole bit, and again you can move that around in time or in level or whatever. Okay, so that's the select tool. And then we have our curve tool, and the way that works is you click on the line and you pull it to make concave curves, push it whoops, to make convex curves, and somewhere if you drag left to right it makes these S shapes like that. Now it's a bit jumpy, and it can jump suddenly from doing convex or concave curves to doing S shapes, but one technique you can use is once you've got the thing pushing out a concave or convex curve, just hold down shift while you still got hold of the line, and from that point on you can't go to the S shape, and the dragging becomes finer, you can make finer moves. Let go of shift and then just tweak it a little left or right and you get the S shape happening and once that's happening again hold down shift and then you can change that S shape much more finely but you can never accidentally slip to, to go to doing convex concurve shapes right concurve what am I talking about is that right convex concaved sorry 
Okay, so that's employing the shift, but you must have hold of the line first. Now I've got hold of shift, I'm stuck in doing the S shape, but it's finer movement. Let go of shift, just twiddle that, just tweak this a bit, and I suddenly, now I've got rid of the S shape like that, and I've got it into this concave curve. Now hold down shift, and now I can only push or pull that shape, and the movement is much finer. That's the curve tool. And you get, you know, just experiment, learn how to use it, because for example, I've got this curve coming up here to a peak, then it then it dies away. Now, if I wanted to make this into a nice curve that comes over the top, I'd have to add in extra nodes to do that. So I use the pointer tool. You know, I'd have to add in some additional nodes to, in order to achieve that shape. Okay, and I'd have to do it something like this. I'd have to then make those little nodes. Then use the curve tool. Push in a bit of a curve there. Push in a bit of a curve there, and then either do that or push the curve whatever you see what I mean but you, you'll get used to oops shift come on no come on con that's it yeah you know experiment it's not that hard to get used to it but it is fiddly and I will say out of everything in logic the the hyperdraw the drawing of these curves and things and then it's the worst most out of date part of logic that really needs to be fixed okay but anyway there we go we have to we have to work with what we've got don't we um okay so that's the tools now that just leaves one thing that's the automation snapping um if you look up here in the snap menu uh, snap automation can be put on we've been into this already um so you just you know if it's not on you highlight and let go and now it shall be ticked now, if you're in anything above ticks, our automation snaps to whatever the snap value is. So I can choose division, for example, and then snap this node around, and it's snapping to divisions. Choose beat, and it's snapping now to beat lines. Okay, so that also then allows us to look at this automation snap offset. Let's look at that. You select it, and this box appears in the preferences uh, automation, and um, here it is, snap offset, just here. Now I've set it to zero. By default, Logic actually has it set to minus five ticks. Now let's just see what that is all about. Let's get the zoom tool. Just zoom in on this one node here like that. Now there's this node, right? I'll put my snap back into division and we're snapping the, the automation. Oops. <sighs> right, I'll get the, oh my God, my, 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 my mouse has had it. I'm trying to do right click there. Okay, I choose the pointer tool. Okay, so we put the snap in division, and there's the node. Now let's snap it to a division line, and it snaps. Snap. 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 And it is snapping to divisions, but if you actually look, look, you can see that the node is actually not on the division line, it's in front of it because our offset is minus five ticks, which means that any nodes that are in there snap to the grid will be five ticks before the actual timing of the music, because we're delaying the nodes by minus five ticks. Now the idea of this is, and why, why it's set as the default, is it gives your automation moves, um, your, your controller moves, sorry, it gives them a chance to latch before the timing of the music. They're, all the controller uh, nodes that are in there are usually critical to how they work with notes in the pattern, right? So this offset, which Logic puts in of minus five ticks by default, allows these uh, these MIDI controller movements to just trigger slightly ahead of the timing of the music, giving the uh, parameters that they're controlling time to latch. Now, if your synth responds slowly to the controllers, you can increase that offset so that the um, timing of the automation happens even earlier than the notes or whatever you like. But for the purpose of this tutorial, I'm going to set it to zero. Okay. But just bear in mind that if you do happen to be zoomed in and you're looking at the notes and you're, you're thinking, well, damn it, I've snapped the damn thing to the grid. Why is it off the grid? Well, that's why. Okay. But I wouldn't change it, actually. I'd leave it in minus five ticks. But bear in mind, that's what it is. Okay, so that is all the tools for hyperdraw and how to use them all right and bear in mind i did show you that you can cycle around hyperdraw in place on the region in the arrange area you know with command y and the tools are the same 
when you, if you happen to edit that. I wouldn't, but if you do, it's the point. It make sure that your snap is correct. You know, if snap to aut automation isn't on, then it, it will ignore any snap here. Okay, but you can use the pointer tool for most things. You know, clicking to add nodes, clicking to remove them, moving nodes. It's it's all the same. The tools work the same. Everything is the same here. All right. Okay. So that's the tools. Okay, um, so we've looked at HyperDraw from the point of view of traditional use. We've shown how to use it to input controllers if we wanted to control a hardware synth. Uh, we've showed how to use the tools and the snap offset and all that business. So now let's move on. And I'm now going to talk about a bit of history, which as beginners we need to know. I mean, I don't have to tell you this, but I, I think it'll help you to understand the whole thing better. So um, let's now move on and look at the next progression along this story of HyperDraw and everything like that. All right. OK, I'm just going to zoom this back out like that. OK, all right. OK, so that's a bit of history now. OK, so that was how it worked in the old days with hardware. Well, I've shown you how we did it. We would input our controllers manually by drawing them in or recording them in from dedicated hardware controllers either on the synth or third party units. And everything was happy. And then software instruments came along. Okay, and people were like, oh my god, you know, software instruments. And um, it all started with Propellerhead's rebirth, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Um, so, you know, people were kind of like, oh my god, software synths, they sound like old synths, and they're in, they, I can do them on my computer, and to be honest, it was mostly Windows users going berserk, because they could download these things as cracks, you know. And uh, anyway, software synths were here. Now, initially, they were standalone. You couldn't integrate them into your host sequencer. And there were things like, as I said, Propellerhead's Rebirth, and there was Master Zap's Stomper Drumbox, and there was this incredible synth called Vaz. V A Z, uh, designed by this guy from the Midlands in England, Keith something I think his name was. Uh, that brilliant synth. Uh, Rubber Duck was a fantastic um, standalone 303 imitator, etc. So all these software synths started to appear, but the thing was they were all standalone. You couldn't integrate them into the host sequencer. So all you could do is you could make patterns with them using their own internal sequencers, and then you could import, render those patterns out as audio. And import the audio files and work with the patterns as audio files. But that all changed when Steinberg invented or created the VST instrument. Okay? The VST instrument was a type of software instrument that could actually be loaded onto MIDI tracks inside the host sequencer. Okay? And although, to be honest, it didn't really work properly when it first was introduced, and I don't care what anyone says, it didn't. It took a while for it to begin to work properly. Uh, partly that was because there were not reliable low latency ASIO sound cards at that time. That was one of the problems. Lack of PC power was another problem and just that it generally was a bit clunky. But eventually it started to work uh, when Cubase got to around VST version 3.6, something like that. It started to come together. And all the other sequences also added software instruments um, and they all had it. There we are. Now we had software instruments that could be actually put onto tracks in our sequencer and programmed just as if they were external hardware synths, but their audio output appeared on the software mixer alongside any audio tracks. Fantastic. But for a while we had the software instruments, but we were stuck using the piano roll hyperdraw to control them just like in the old days with hardware. And this introduced the same problem, which was that how the hell were you supposed to know which controller number controlled which parameter of your software synth? So, although we had this ability to use software in our host sequences, which was cheaper and blah, 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 but we were still lumbered with this whole business of working with controller numbers. Now, if I wanted to put in a filter sweep to control my software synth, I'd have to somehow find out the parameter, the controller number, that controlled that filter cutoff. Then I could either 
you know, do the do the same techniques we just showed with hardware. I either go to other and can choose that controller number, and then draw in my sweeps manually, or I set up a third-party hardware controller to send the correct controller number in and record those movements, as I showed just before. But the point is, we were still stuck with this whole thing of looking up numbers. Okay. But sooner or later that all changed because what happened was the next thing to be invented for sequencers was track automation well, some sequencers call it mix automation whatever logic calls it track automation <coughs> pardon me and track automation was the next big step that tied it all together then it all came together now you can i'll just i'm not going to get into this track automation in huge depth but there are certain things we need to look at now um, we'll do a whole chapter on track automation, right? But um, we do need to learn, look at certain aspects of it now because it relates to Hyperdraw and this whole Hyperdraw uh, part of this Piano Edit tutorial, right? So in a range, you hit the A key on your keyboard and it opens or it turns on track automation and the whole display changes. Okay, it all kind of greys down a bit. Well, the, the region colours all grey down, right? And I'll just zoom in so we can see one track header in a bit more detail. And let's see what's happened when we tr turn on track automation. Look, that's it off and that's on. And two new items have appeared on our track header. Okay, we've got this, this kind of slot living across the top. And you drop that down and it reveals this list of, of different things. And there's also this button here, which has got different settings we can choose. We can put it into different states such as read or touch or write etc and this is the uh, track automation mode button okay now this is when everything changed this is and what's important about this whole track or mix automation is when it arrived that was the day that we waved bye bye to numbers <laughs> you, you you especially if you're young and you've never worked with the old equipment in the old days you've got no idea how lucky you are once track automation appeared oh my god it was just a dream because you don't need to look up any more stupid numbers. You just drop the list down here and every single parameter of everything that lives on this track and channel strip combination can be chosen by name. <laughs> right? There's no need to look up numbers anymore. Now you've got the main objects. That's everything that's on the actual channel strip. That's the volume, the fader, the pan. Uh, the solo and mute buttons, whether they're on or off. If you've got sends, you can automate the sends. If you've got inserts, you can automate their bypass. Um, so that's the main objects on the channel strip. That can all be automated, as can the individual parameters of every single insert effect that has been put onto that channel strip. And of course, most importantly of all, your software synthesizer is there and every parameter of that synth is listed by name. <laughs> it's just so easy. Now imagine if it was this easy in uh, Hyperdraw. We would drop this list down and we'd be able to choose our ESM and choose its parameters by name. But ah, no, it don't work that way, you see. But with track automation, we just choose ESM, cut off, and just like with Hyperdraw, we then use the pointer tool and we draw in a cut off move. And sure enough, without looking up any stupid numbers, that will sweep the filter of our software synth, guaranteed. Couldn't be easier. It could not be easier. Now, how does this actually work? Well, think about it. Let's say if I change the ESM for something with more parameters, like the ES1. Okay. Now, let's look. Let's look at our list and see. How many things are available on this one track to be automated? How many parameters? Okay, well, we've got our main objects on our channel strip. That's about, I don't know, what is that? One, two, three, four, five, well, that's 10 or 11 parameters. So let's call that 10. Uh, let's call that 30, so that's 40 parameters. 50, 60 parameters. Uh, that's 92 parameters in total now. Uh, 115 parameters, 
130 parameters, 140, 35 parameters or something, and then this, a good 160 parameters, all on the same track, and every one of these parameters can be controlled individually all at the same time if you wanted to, so they must all have a separate controller number. Otherwise they'd clash, right? But if we look in Piano Roll, Hyperdraw, our MIDI continuous controllers, if we choose other, we've only got 128, and therein lies the secret of how this track automation works. Beyond your 128 basic MIDI CC controllers, there are other forms of MIDI controller that are much more complicated, like system exclusive, which is a form of much more cryptic code. It's still MIDI code, but it uses strings of digits, strings of code, which can be, which can control th certain things. Also, y you know, you've got the control numbers themselves. And what Logic does is it simply maps all these parameters which are listed by name to numbers in the background. So we never have to deal with numbers. We can have as many parameters as we want controlled at the same time. They will never clash because Logic is cleverly allocating a different controller number to all these parameters in the background. We now do away with numbers. We now are forever rid of that faffing about choosing numbers all the time. So I'll choose my ESM again. I like the ESM actually. Okay, so that's why track automation is so important. Once we had that, we could then choose the parameters for our synth by name. Easy peasy. Choose the cutoff and it's the same then as Hyperdraw. We then just draw in our filter move. It's as simple as that. No need to look up any numbers. Okay, and you want to then put another layer in, fine, just choose the ESM and choose the resonance and uh, bung in some other resonance, like I'll, I'll make it go down over there and then I'll make it peak up like here or something like that, I don't know, whatever, blah blah blah. There you go, bit of resonance, and now the resonance and the cutoff are both active on that uh, track as track automation and, and any parameters that are active appear in uh, below the main list here so you can easily see what's active okay so they've got resonance and cutoff and if we look at the ESM we can see those parameters moving all right maybe my cutoff is slightly too drastic there let's just Bump that up a bit. Like that. Etc. Right, it's as simple as pie. Do you see how fantastic this track automation is? It, the, what's important about it is, is it, it, this is the point at which we wave goodbye to numbers. We simply choose the parameter by name and we then put in the moves just like Hyperdraw. Okay, exactly the same as Hyperdraw. But it's track automation, it's not hyperdraw. Okay, now, that is all brilliant, but that's not all that's brilliant about it. Let me just, um, I mean, you know, look, see, I'm getting rid of these nodes just like in hyperdraw. I drag on one of the nodes and it hoovers up the rest, let go, and then click and delete the last couple of nodes. Now there's no more cutoff, it's not in the list. So now I'll choose the resonance. Again, grab the last node, hoover forward then click on the last couple of those to delete them and that's it. No more active controllers on that track. Now not only could we simply choose the names here and then draw in our moves just like with Hyperdraw but we can choose our parameters by name and then record them in using hardware controllers but track automation makes it even easier. With track automation just how we don't need to look up numbers to choose the parameters we also do not need to look up and change any numbers on our hardware controller. We can use a single hardware controller and allocate it as our automation quick access controller. And you only need one hardware controller to do this. So if you have got a very cheap, small footprint MIDI master keyboard and all it has gone on it apart from the keys is a mod wheel and a pitch bend wheel, that's all you need. You just need the mod wheel and this is how it works. My duet is currently set up as a MIDI controller. It's sending in a single MIDI control number and there it is coming into logic there on MIDI controller number 90, right? Shoal, 
I will set up the Duet as my automation quick access controller. I go to track, track automation, and I choose automation preferences. Now, look here, automation quick access. It's off. You put it on. If it's on, then when you drop this menu down, track, track automation, you will see automation quick access is ticked. Okay, all right. So you put it on and you click learn message. Now all I do is twiddle my single hardware controller and it's learned. Click done, that's it. It's done. It's learned. And now look, check it out. Not only do I not have to look up the numbers to choose the parameters for my synth or anything else on that channel strip, right? So I can choose the cutoff, but my hardware controller is now automatically controlling that cutoff. <laughs> look at that. Hey. So uh, it's automatic control. All automatic. You just choose the parameter. So I choose resonance and now my hardware controller, that single hardware controller is automatically mapped to control the resonance for the PSM. Um, I want to control the volume on my actual track, the fader. Again, I just choose volume and look at the fader down here on the track here. I'm now controlling it from the duet. So it's it's just incredible. You not only have this ability to choose everything by name and we wave bye-bye to looking up stupid numbers, but our single hardware controller automatically is mapped to whatever parameter we choose. Let me just reset this um, fader. It's just fantastic. So there's the two advantages of track automation. Okay. And that's how they fit in, in terms of the history of this whole thing. So now we choose the parameter and we pencil in just like with HyperDraw. Or sorry, not pencil in, click in with the pointer tool. It's the same tools as HyperDraw, exactly the same tools. You've got the curve tool, select tool, all the rest of it is exactly the same. Hoover up the same, everything. But we can also easily record in from hardware. And the difference here is we aren't sending MIDI con control data in anymore via Logic's MIDI input. Now look at the look at the MIDI input monitor down here on the transport bar now. I rotate that duet wheel now and look there's no MIDI control information coming in. There's nothing coming into Logic. And again this is like when we did the step input stuff. Remember that? With the step input keyboard when I clicked on the notes it, it dumped the notes directly from the step input keyboard onto the piano roll grid. Do you remember that? It bypassed Logic's MIDI input completely. And what's happening here is the same thing. The duet rotary controller, or in your case it might be a mod wheel or something, it is now assigned as the quick access controller. So Logic ignores it at the MIDI input. And now that we're not sending MIDI control data in via Logic's MIDI input to record that control data, we don't even need to hit record. That's where this track automation mode button comes in. Now if it's in off, you can't write data you can still pencil in, but you can't write data from a hardware controller and you can't, and it won't read any data that's already there. If it's in write, it will only write data but not read data. And if it's in touch or latch, it will write data when you move a hardware controller, but otherwise it will simply read. So you, you tend to use touch or latch, but mostly touch to, to when, for when you write because it, it will not overwrite anything that's previously there, any track automation that's previously on the track. But otherwise you have it in read, and that way you can't accidentally write any controller information, but it will read any track automation that's on the track. So for example, I'll put it into touch. I don't need to hit record, I just hit play. So I'll take the cycle range off, watch this, hit play, and as soon as I move the automation quick access controller, it will start to write in control moves. Yep, simple as that, and I've recorded in some cutoff control for that synth. Then I go, all right, right, great. Now I'll do some resonance. No need to do anything. Just move my controller. It's now controlling the resonance. Same thing. Hit play, and when I move the controller, it will record. There you go, and there's my resonance. Easy bloody peasy. So that's track automation, and you can see the difference. This was the final step in the story. Um, we've come a long way from controlling hardware since in HyperDraw, looking up numbers and all that, 
mapping controllers and all the rest of it to track automation where we simply choose a name for a parameter and instantly we're controlling it with a single hardware controller. It couldn't be easier. That's the upside of track automation. I won't get into the different modes here. We'll do. We'll save that for when we do a track automation uh, tutorial. Okay, so that's the great part about track automation. Yeah, I mean, how can you argue with that, right? Let me just thin this data out. Use the same techniques, remember, as Hyperdraw. It's exactly the same. We use the same tools, same techniques, everything. Okay, so that's that's the upside of track automation. It's just brilliant. But it, the problems begin to occur once we've got the track automation actually on the track. Okay, everything's great because, you know, with track automation otherwise, we don't need to look up stupid numbers. We have automation quick access. What could be better? But the problems start to occur when you have that track automation then actually recorded on a track. Let me just choose the cutoff. And again, I'll just tweak that. I'll zoom in showing that. Because it is all the same tools. I can use the same hoovering technique. Grab a node, drag that away, let go. And it's hoovered up all those nodes, etc. I just want to make these moves more basic. So I'm just knocking out nodes like this, thinning it out. Okay, and then I'll just drop that down and put a little movement like that at the beginning. There we go. So there we go. That's the cutoff. I've just tidied it up a bit. But you know, this is track automation. It's all the same. You move around and grab things with the pointer tool to adjust them. You've got the same thing, the select tool to grab clusters of nodes and move them around as a group. You've got the same thing of the curve tool to push and pull and draw curves, etc. It's all the same as Hyperdraw, right? Okay, so track automation, absolutely genius. And it was the next step and it took us away from this whole thing of looking up numbers and it gave us automation quick access. So we didn't have to, we didn't have to look up numbers to choose parameters and we didn't need to change uh, the parameters that are being sent out from our hardware controllers. It's all done for us now automatically. What could be better? The problem now lies in the fact that we've now got that data on the track. Okay, now the problems begin, or they can be problems, right? This is this is the downside of track automation, right? Now let me show you that next. Let's move on now and look at the whole thing to do with track automation in terms of its downside, okay?